Singapore is less than 60 years old, and here you see all of the combination of different cultures that come together. In the cuisine today, I'm going to show you a prime example of that, where you see Chinese and Malay come together to create Peranakan food. This restaurant, Violet Oons, is a prime example of amazing fusion, and I'm literally going to show you a taste of Nonya today. So, Oshan, welcome to Violet Oons. Thank you. Everyone, this is my friend Oshan, and she runs a fantastic company that's also related to healthy food. You want to share a little bit about what you're doing actually in your business right now? I love it. So we're working on a campaign um, where we have the solution to get rid of pesticides and the, the produce that we use and eat daily. Mmm, it's just so good because, yeah, I mean, what is clean food if we're not considering the source of the food? You know, has it got pesticides and chemicals? All of that is included. I love what you do. So, Oshan, I brought you here because I really love Pranican food. Because, like, what Violet Oon has done here is not only has she become like this like local celebrity icon, but she's created real fusion, which is all these different cultures coming together, creating literally a melting pot through the food. Mm, yeah. And so, I think this restaurant really represents that. And to my surprise. She then went on and took it to the next level and launched a plant-based, gluten-free menu. Can you imagine, like, that? Like, so many people come to me and go, "Oh, it's not, it's not easy to eat locally and eat healthy," and and then this exists. I'm just like, she has literally gone beyond my expectations. Delicious gluten-free food. Yes, okay. I know, I know, and Veronica. So I have chose these dishes for you today off the plant-based gluten-free menu. Um, it's not all vegan, there is some eggs and cheese in that in one of these dishes. Um, but you know, it's all plant-based, it's amazing. The first dish um, that I want you to try is this one. So this one is their nasi goreng, so it's a nasi goreng cancun. And then I've chosen this dish, which I think is an amazing one as well. It's their oyster mushroom. Um, and then this one is probably a little bit more commonly seen in the local cuisine. So that's the it's eggplant fun. sambal, yeah. And I've got to say, without any exaggeration, this is the best meatless meatballs I've ever tasted. So these are the meatballs, the rendang meatballs mm. that are completely meatless. They're made with walnuts and cheese in like this like rendang creamy coconut sauce. Oh, so good! <laughs> what do you think of the dishes I've chosen? It sounds really exciting and we're yeah. excited to try the food. Yay! So let's get in. Let's try everything. So I think we should definitely try these meatballs first. Meatless so, meatballs. Meatless meatballs. So you just dig in. Oh my gosh, yeah. You'll know exactly what I mean when you try this. And it's not artificial meat, it's, it's real whole food. That's the thing, that, that's what I love about this even more, is that there are so many of these plant-based alternatives, but a lot of them, you know, it's really difficult for me to kind of support it because I understand that it's great for people that are transitioning yep. and you know they're going through their own journey from reducing their meat consumption but a lot of them are really heavily processed or have a lot of genetically modified soy in them as the main ingredients. This one she's made from walnuts mm. yeah, and it has like a cheesy sauce inside. It's so beautiful, let's try this. Mm. What do you think? I like the richness of the, the ingredients and, yeah. and it, it goes really well with the, the spice and the gravy. Yeah, right? Yeah. So good. So, tell me, what do you think generally about this whole, you know, health focus? Especially Singapore is really like at the, the forefront of now, especially with like plant-based, cell-grown, cell lab-grown meat. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. Um, I'm not really a fan of lab grown meat or even artificial meat. I always think that you know if possible it's better for us to eat healthy wholesome ingredients. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, the concern that we have is that um, you know um, having the you know so so many different ethnic cities in Singapore and, and we have like Chinese cuisine, we have Malay cuisine, Indonesian cuisine, Thailand cuisine, it's so much food, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you think is the what do you think of the normal typical Asian diet comparing uh, say um, 
Chinese cuisine with Malay cuisine and, and, and Thai food so like, do you think they are health, healthy if we, if we eat the same type of food every day? Okay, so I mean what I think about the different types of cuisines in Asia is that like all cuisines all over the world they can be healthy and they can be unhealthy. Right. So my biggest concern is with a lot of these cuisines, the traditions, mm. the ingredients of the, or the origin of those foods have changed. So now, for example, when you look at um, Malay cuisine, Indonesian cuisine, the oil that was used was a lot of coconut oil and cold pressed coconut oil. Whereas now there's a lot of heavily processed oils like vegetable oil. The meats, the quality of the meats that were used, you know in Singapore we call it like the camp on chicken, right? Yeah. That was like the farm, you know, like free-range chicken. That's not what's being used anymore. Right. Should we try the mushroom? Sure. These are definitely king oysters. So huge. And, and all these are gluten-free? Yeah. So every dish that we're trying today is gluten-free. For them to launch this as their plant-based menu is absolutely like amazing for me to just be able to show people what can exist. In, in the plant-based community right now. Wow. The lemon is really good. Mm. And I love using mushrooms because they're so meaty. And so when you use these as an alternative in plant-based dishes, you really get the texture profile that you're looking for in your food. So you don't feel like you're missing out if you haven't had meat. Yeah, it feels you are bro with the, the, the from the, the fiber of the mushrooms. Mm. Yeah. And it's really exciting that it's gluten free because uh, there are a lot of people these days um, um, have got um, gluten intolerance, so it's not easy to go to a proper restaurant to, yeah. to order food and mm -hmm. knowing that you know you will not have any um, um, bad reaction after eating food that may have gluten in it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So what do you think is the reason why there are a lot more people these days getting um, like gluten intolerance? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What would be the cost of it? Yeah, I mean, and it's really frustrating, so I'm glad that you asked that because so many people now are like, you know, it can't be the, it can't be the bread, it can't be that, you know, I've always eaten that. But the thing is right now is that the food that we're eating nowadays has changed. So let's say, for example, so gluten is Latin for the word glue, and it's a protein that's found inside some grains. Some grains contain gluten, some don't. But the common grains with gluten is wheat, barley, and rice. And rice. Wheat, barley and rye are being used in so many of our dishes in the modern day world, especially in the Western diet. So if you think about wheat flour, think of the breads, the pastas, the noodles, all of that now contains wheat flour. Yeah. And that's one of the most genetically modified crops. It's very heavily sprayed with pesticides and chemicals. Wow. And the, the wheat grain that we eat today isn't the old ancient wheat grain, like it's called einkorn. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different grain. This new genetically modified version, it actually also has a different protein profile and has more gluten. Oh. That now coupled with the stress of the modern day living, has meant that there's a real pressure on people's immune system. And so what you're having now is someone experiences a trauma, that could be any type of trauma, it could be stress at work, stress at home, stress, some form of stress, their immune system is suppressed, and now their immune system is more susceptible to everything that goes inside there. Mm. So now that you see that they trigger all of these different allergies and now you've got a weakened immune system gluten comes along yeah. it creates these microscopic tears in the immune system that's weakened and now you have somebody that's got a gluten allergy or at worst they've triggered a genetic profile that they already had that they were susceptible to which is celiac and that's oh, the extreme version okay. Next, yeah. so as the crops have changed now and obviously more testing is available more people are realizing that they're now sensitive to gluten or have triggered and, tur and turned on the switch because of the stress in their life, they've turned on the switch for their genetic profile to celiac disease. I see. Mm. Okay. I want you to try this one. Mm. Yeah, so this one is a really good one as well because you've got the eggplant, but then I love how they've given you two different types of sambal so you can try it with the green one. It's a green the, chili. It's a green chili, right? And then you can try it more traditionally with the red sambal, eventually. Did you grow up with sambals? Yeah, we do. We have sambal in almost everything we eat. <laughs> yeah. So but growing up, what type of cuisine were you mainly eating? Because that's what I love about Singapore is the variety. You know, it's not it's so easy to, you know, to, to have like Chinese food, Malay food, Indian food all in one place. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not surprising that we can have Malay food for lunch today and then next day we have Malay, 
Chinese food and, and, and Indian food, etc. Mm. Yeah, so I think we are exposed to Malay, Chinese, uh, Indian, even Thai food uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. I love it because I really love spicy food. And so I remember when I first came to Singapore and everyone was like, be careful, it's too spicy. <laughs> but the thing is, not only do I love spicy food from a flavour point of view, chilli speeds up the metabolism. So, oh, really? Yeah. So all these flavours that you find in Asian cuisine, like ginger, and, and obviously turmeric is great, and black pepper, chilies, all these different sambals, they're so healing for the body because, you know, even like a lot of the Malay and Indonesian food, it does have a lot of oil in the cooking style, yeah. but it also has a lot of chilies. So guess what? Those two complement each other. Balance it off. Exactly. Ah, so we can have fried food and then we have chilli. So it helps to burn the, the fat the fried food. <laughs> well, you know, it helps. Like, I always like to look at it as like, you, you know, fat's not the enemy. So you have processed fats and you have good fats. And fats that come from good, healthy, you know, yeah. unprocessed food. May that be the oils or, or you know, foods that are naturally high in good fats like avocados. Now what we're doing is if we increase the metabolism through certain foods that do that naturally, then it makes it easier for us to digest. And if we're easy to digest, we don't necessarily store fat, you know. Oh, yeah. Makes sense. So do you think this, uh, these are the type of food that we can uh, eat every day? Well, you know, this is the funny thing, isn't it? Is that we get used to thinking that if we eat out, that's a treat and that's not the food that we can eat every day. Oh. But, what I love about this type of food is this is the food that we should be eating every day. Oh, really? These are like those home cooked meals that our parents, our grandparents would have cooked for us, right? Every single thing that we can see in here is whole foods. Okay, maybe the crackers are slightly processed, but they're all whole foods that would have been cooked at home traditionally. Mm. With, you know, good grains like rice, fresh vegetables. You know, these are nuts. The meatballs are made from nuts. And, you know, and these are the foods that we need to go back to eating. What, what goes wrong is that when we substitute the quality of the ingredients for lower qualities, and this is what happens a lot when a lot of us eat out, we can't eat that every single day. Yeah. yeah. So, of course, if we're listening to our body, our body will tell us, do we need to eat lighter today? Or, you know, we're looking for something more filling, we're looking for something more warming, more cooling, and we should follow our body. But if we find establishments like this, mm. then when we have cravings for this sort of food, yeah. there's no reason why we can't eat that. I can eat this every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know no local table is without a really good nasi lemak. So this one you have to try. Nasi goreng and nasi lemak were like my um, favourite dishes when I first came to Singapore. And I, I love the way they've done this one. So that's the fried rice. This is the fried rice, yeah. And it's so, because in England, like, you know, like you have this Chinese fried rice and it's and it's, it's, I love it, you know, how every single culture has their own slightly different version, but this one, I think, I like the spice level of it, and I love how they've incorporated the flavours, and it's still, you know, it's plant-based, it's got, it's full of flavour, it's filling, mm. oh my gosh, the rice is cooked so well, I, I remember when I first started thinking about creating rice dishes in my own restaurant, and I was like, Oh my gosh, there are so many different types of rice out there. Like, you know, when I was back in the UK, it was like, there's rice, and that's it. You know, <laughs> then you come to Asia and you're like, oh, which rice goes well with this? And yeah. the same with noodles, right? Yeah. What do you think with, there's so many types of rice, there's the short grain rice, and then you have the Thai uh, long grain rice, yeah. and then you've got Japanese pork rice. Yeah. What do you think with this? Which is your favourite? Well, for me, my favourite rice is basmati rice. But I'm going to tell you one thing that I find a bit sad at the moment is that I've noticed, especially with my clients, is that you know everyone's a little bit scared of rice here in Asia, and that's because you know um, rice has been put under the category of carbohydrates and carbohydrates under the category of bad food. Yeah. And it's like ancestrally Asians grew up with rice as a staple. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with rice. With rice yeah. Of course, nothing in food is black and white. There are good and bad versions. Yeah. Like you know, I want my rice to be organic so that it's not covered in pesticides. But you know, rice is a whole food that comes from nature, right. and so it's not something that we should be scared of, and especially if that's your ancestral diet, right? And I noticed this shift more recently because of diabetes in Singapore. People are looking also at like you know brown rice and more fibrous types of rice. 
But it's interesting because I've been reading also about Asians not having the, the genes, um, the genetic enzyme, should I say, to actually break down brown rice. Oh. I know. Right. So isn't that funny that ancestrally they always knew to polish the rice? What about you? What do you think about different rices? You know, because I've been reading up and, and they, you know, there are studies that you know they have been telling us so maybe we should take rice that has got lower GI. Mm -hmm. You know, that way we, the body has got lesser lesser sugar to process. So I'm not sure whether that's right or not. But you know, like as a typical Asian, we grew up with uh, eating rice on a day to day basis. Exactly. And what about the pesticides? Because obviously your business is all about removing the pesticides and chemicals from food. Yeah. What have you known about that with, when it comes to rice sourcing? So, uh, most of the, the paddy field right now um, is heavily contaminated with pesticides and heavy metals. Mm. So, it's, it's, a known, it's a known fact that most of the rice that we, we purchase or we consume on a day to day basis, they, they've got the residues or chemical um, pesticides residues on the, on, the, on the rice. So, we do have to clean the rice thoroughly before we eat them. Say like normally if we were to wash the, the white rice right on, with water and you probably get a very light milky you know colour and that's probably just starch right mm -hmm. but most of the pesticides that they use these days are oil based so when we use our product to spray onto the rice and then we see oh fluorescent yellow chemicals coming off so these are the oil based pesticides that we manage to remove from it and there's one particular incident where we were in, uh, in Malaysia, right? Yeah. So they, they were all promoting their local, locally grown rice and uh, you know, I was just talking to my professor and he said, oh, you happen to wash the rice and then you can see green colour water coming up from the rice, that means that the rice got heavy, uh, very high heavy metal content. I was like, are you wow, sure? Wow. Yeah, that's what happened. So, so when I did a workshop in Malaysia and I was given some locally grown rice and when I spray on it, I was like, whoa, green water. Oh. It just unbelievable yeah um, the amount of heavy metals we are consuming from you know the innocent food that we've been going yeah. up with so this is why it's so important to support restaurants that are going out of their way to create healthy dishes to look at the ingredients yeah. to work with people like you that are providing you know pesticide removal solutions to clean our food yeah. this is why we have to support those and also why when we get when we find those restaurants we can we can have fun, we can eat the foods that we love, we can enjoy yeah. it and we can feel safe. Um, we need to get the balance right. right. We can't be petrified every single time we eat out or petrified with everything that we put in our mouth. But we have to find those people that are supporting that yeah. and eat there rebelliously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the best. So, can I tell you something really exciting? Yeah. I have desserts! <laughs> Gluten-free desserts? Gluten-free desserts! So hold yourself, don't get too full. That's the best. Yes. So what do you think of the look of these desserts that I've chosen? Wow. So this one, yeah, this look, this cake looks really, really interesting. Yeah, right? So this is the tapioca cake with gula malacca wow. and coconut cream. This one, does it, have you seen something like this? I think it, this is, it looks something like a pulut hitam, is that? Yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. So it's, this one's a black glutinous rice and they've done it with coconut ice cream. Wow. So this one is vegetarian and gluten free. This one is vegan and gluten free. So vegetarian and vegan. Yeah, and so this is just, I mean, this to me is what I really love about like truly rebellious, like healthy food. It's like all of these, like when they've made this cake from scratch using tapioca as the main starchy substance to thicken this with. Instead of using a heavily processed white sugar, oh, they've used gula malacca, right? Which isn't a heavily processed sugar. It's you know it, it's sourced locally, and then you know to use coconuts as well. They're naturally sweet and give the creaminess. This takes a little bit of creativity. So these are healthy desserts. These are healthy desserts. So when we understand what true health is about, true health is about whole grains. True health is about things from nature. Yeah, we change the shape. Like when I make coconut ice cream, all I'm really doing is changing the shape of the substance and using the temperature to create it as well. Right. But you know, it, we, we don't need to like think that we can't eat the foods that we love if we find places that are really passionate about how they source the ingredients and how they put them together. And with the food made with the wholesome ingredients are the best. Exactly. Yeah. So let's try. Yeah. So just. Help yourself. I know, oh. I, know, I know. It's like okay. Let me try this cake first. Um, and we drizzle the coconut cream.
cream over it. You know what, you have it however you want. Because can I just say, this is the type of food that I eat for breakfast. Wow. Really? <laughs> yeah. Dessert for breakfast? Because the thing is, who says cake has to be dessert? That's true. The food industry, right? Yeah. The same industry that tells us that we have to have breakfast cereals at breakfast time. But that's a marketing trick. Yeah. Like food from nature is food. Right. And so like things like things like this, and there is actually a Brazilian version of this like tapioca cake. And they would eat it throughout the day. They would have it at breakfast as well. You know, French, they have pastries for breakfast, they have croissants. Wow. So why not have this for breakfast? So we can have this for breakfast, lunch, dinner, supper. Yes, you can. <laughs> as soon as we find what like real food is really about, yeah. then we can have it at whatever time we want. And you know, we what we're looking for is we're looking at, you know, what is the ingredients as opposed to is everything bad for me? You know, you know, we've got to be mindful of what's going into our bodies, but we also have to find the sustainable way to do that. So it's the ingredients that makes the meal. The ingredients that make the meal, it's it's in when we're eating out, it's the restaurants that care about where the ingredients are sourced from. It's how they put it together. You know, do they use shortcuts? You know, is everything heavily processed? Like we're not seeing flour in all of our food, but yet so many of us flour has become the staple for every single dish. Yeah. And with this, you can actually taste the freshness of the ingredient, the freshness of the tapioca. Mm. It's just a rich taste, you know, um, if you compare to eating the cakes up there, we know it's just a generic taste. Exactly. And I love, I love that the fact that they're using Kula Malacca as a sweetener, which is very typical in, in for Anakin dishes, but this is because that is the origin of the sweetener, of the sugars used in Asian cuisine. And so it really is a shame that we've moved towards like you know white refined sugar as the sweetener. And Gula Malacca has that beautiful caramel flavour that's just so gorgeous. I mean the Canadians they have maple syrup. Asia, we have Gula Malacca. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and also if we were to compare eating Gula Malacca and white sugar, right? Yeah. Um, what is the difference between that? Yeah, it's a really good question. So Gula Malacca comes from the palm of the nectar of the coconut flower. Right. And so what we have here is we have a less processed ingredient. We're starting with a whole, a whole ingredient and it's not gone through heavy amounts of processing. Now when we start, when we have like the white sugar that's in, our, in a lot of our desserts, we start with a whole ingredient too, the sugar cane. But then that sugar cane is stripped of its fibre, right. very heavily processed and we end up with that white crystal-like substance. Yeah. which really has no nutritional value apart from just uh, giving us energy because it spikes our blood sugar. With the Gula Malacca, it's a lower GI, which means that the rate of conversion to sugar in our body is a lot slower. So we don't get that spike of the blood sugar, the crash afterwards. So we can still have sugar, but this, the source or where the sugar comes from is Yeah, really we want sugars that are less processed, not as refined, um, and yeah, more natural in terms of, you know, as close to its original source as possible, which is what we find in Gula Malacca. So we have Gula Malacca for everything. Mm. Gula Malacca with chocolate, with Gula coffee. Gula Malacca for everything. <laughs> mm. Now, this one you must try. I love how you've got this black glutinous rice, really, really sticky and yummy. It actually reminds me of um, mango sticky rice in Thailand. Mm -hmm. And the coconut ice cream just beautifully melts into this, into this rice. If this, if this rice is not creamy enough, it definitely will be after you have this ice cream. It's a very interesting mix, having rice with ice cream. Yes, but you know what? I mean, in England we have rice pudding. And so you look across the world and you see that everybody has their own version of rice pudding. And so that's what this is. This, this is this version of their own rice pudding. And it's like, the, again, finding ways to sweeten the food. So they've actually stewed the rice grains in Gula Malacca as well to create the sweetness. And then this is the great thing because coconut is naturally sweet. Right. So you use coconut ice cream to top that up. You give it the creaminess and more sweetener. So can you have this every day? You can have this every day. If, you're, if your body craves it, your body needs it. Well, that's not always true because I mean, we know that sometimes we crave burgers and pizzas, but that's because of the sugar that's in that that we're addicted to. So what do you think of the taste? The rice is being stewed um, um, really well. You can taste the softness of the green and 
it just melts in the mouth. It's really good. I love it, and I love that the rice gives it some texture, but it's still so creamy. I can taste the sweetness coming from the gula malacca, and yeah, this is it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in love with anything that's using gula malacca as a natural sweetener. They're so creative, but it's, be surprised that ice cream and rice can go so well together. Mm. So, I hope, Osham, that I have really inspired you, not only to, to find other restaurants that can use your pesticide removal spray, but also that, you know, I know you mentioned to me before about having challenges around eating out and gluten free, you know, looking for gluten free dishes, but to see local dishes that are inspiring, that are true to the origins and therefore not heavily processed. You can eat healthy, but you can still enjoy all the flavors that you love. Yeah, it's really good uh, if you go to a restaurant and um, knowing that the restaurant actually uses wholesome ingredients and, you know, using healthy alternatives, say gula malaka versus refined sugar and, you know, creating plant-based options as well, gluten-free options. It, we really have to give it to the chef for creating such a We really do, right? Menu. We've literally have been taken through a journey of Nonya or the Peranakan history through the food. So here is to Peranakan food. So what did you think guys? Isn't this truly rebellious? Who knew that you could have dishes like this and still stay healthy? And that's what I love to show you. I mean, you saw that last dish, black glutinous rice with coconut ice cream, tapioca with gula malacca. This is the food that I eat. When you focus on all the right things, you understand that you can truly have the foods that you love. Violet Oon has literally taken us through a journey and shown us the melting pot of what we can find in this Peranakan cuisine. She's shown us through creating plant-based, gluten-free dishes that we can still look after our health and we can have an amazing experience when eating out. So if I haven't inspired you already to look at Peranakan food or to try Violet Oon's restaurant, then what will? <laughs> Take care, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you got the inspiration that you need to see that you can find dishes and you can tweak menus to make sure that you eat exciting, healthy and flavoursome food while still staying on track of your health goals. Now, leave me a comment below and make sure you subscribe to this channel so that I can make sure that you get the support you need in order to achieve your health goals. And if you're a restaurant and you'd like to be considered, make sure you drop me an email at alika.co. At